um, but perhaps what's changed has already changed. We just haven't seen it yet, and we are moving, you know, towards a new time in theater. Performance, dramaturgy, and the arts have always been very close to it. Actually, people study this to see because you earlier on could notice what was the time really about. It manifests itself that what Adorno and so many others philosophers said, you know, that's why we are so close to the arts and artists have been on the right side of history, on the right side of change. They were on the right side of the complex struggle for freedom and freedom of speech. And I think this is the same again, and this is why we listen since uh, March to artists. Since uh, um, September, we also opened the field, and uh, we at the Seagull think there is an enlarged understanding of theater and performance and what art means, theater arts, and producers, dramaturgs, curators, um, literary managers, are artists, they are collaging, they are putting things together, they are part of the team, the collaborative work that has become, I think, much, much more important also as a mark of contemporary good theater and dramaturgs have been at the forefront. It's such a big field, a complicated field, a tradition of hundreds of years, a shorter one in the U.S., and <clears throat> I personally always thought that they are the guider, the people who guide you, like the stalkers in Tarkovsky's zone who bring you to the room. And then you have to choose if you get in or not, whether you are the director or the audience member, <clears throat> the sponsor or whoever. And with us today, we have two um, pioneering dramaturgs uh, from the Americas uh, here and see now, of course, it's the US and it's uh, in New York City. And we with ha have with us two uh, great, great artists, uh, theater artists. It is uh, uh, Sidney Mahone and Anne Catania. And I will say a few things about them and then we will go right away uh, into the discussion. But so you just so we have a little context, we also have many international um, listeners, and they have no idea what a Lincoln Center Theater is and if it's bigger or not um, than St. Mark's Church Theater. And uh, so, and Catania, first of all, thank you for being here. Sidney Mahal, thank you for coming. Thank you. And, and Catania is the dramaturg of Lincoln Center Theater, and many of us think it is, if there is a national theater in the United States, it's the closest, perhaps, uh, in the way that we have. And she's the co-executive editor of the Lincoln Center Theater Review, a brilliant uh, publication that is, you know, going on the edition of Lessing's Theater Blätter, the, the idea that you give context uh, to the complexity of the themes you show on the stage. And she's the creator and head of the Tony Award Honor nominated Lincoln Center Theater's director's lab, thousands of artists from around the world as the global initiative have come to Anne, who had made that possible uh, on long nights to write applications and get grants to have theater artists, young directors from the entire world come to Lincoln Center for six weeks and to discuss the graph. It has been enormously influential and it created an unparalleled network. I don't know anything that's compared to it. Close to it, perhaps the Royal Court. Um, the international program by Elise Dockerson was not as grand in scope, I think, as the Lincoln Center, but still uh, also very influential, but it was uh, for, for playwriting. She was the recipient of the um, literary managers uh, and drama talks uh, first Lessing Award. Actually, she herself was president, I'm sure co-founder of uh, that important American uh, association of drama talks. She translated uh, Bertolt Brecht, she translated Boto Strauss and many, many others, Ernst Jandl, and she has taught theater history for many years uh, at Juilliard, and she is the winner of the significant Margot Jones medal uh, that uh, she got, I think, if I remember right, uh, Meryl Streep gave her. And so she has dedicated her life uh, uh, to uh, playwriting, to producing theater, and uh, uh, to, to theater um, everywhere. She is also the author of a book that's forthcoming, I think, next year, most probably, The Art of Dramaturgy uh, at Yale University Press. So it's perhaps too early to talk about it. She also got the 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship. And um, very early on, Anne collaborated uh, with Sidney Mahone. And Anne said, you know, we need to have her. She's significant. She's important. Her work uh, should get uh, the exposure it deserves. And she, Sydney is an independent dramaturg and the editor of two books, Moon Market and Touched by the Sun, placed by African-American women, and also with Aussie and uh, Ruby, of course we know who she talks about, in this life together. She uh, was the associate professor of theater arts 
in African American Studies at the University of Iowa. In 2019, she served as the guest editor of the Review, the Journal of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas, Lambda. And uh, her production credits is uh, a list too, too long to name from Wilson, Dove, Wolf, uh, uh, Shange, Lee. I mean, it's incredible. It's the who is who um, uh, of a theater she's close to, who is, she's fighting for. And uh, she is also a founding staff producer of the Genesis Festival of New Voices. Uh, as you can see now, we have a lot of experience here, decades of work. So first of all, you guys, thank you for joining us and uh, for taking the time out. I know how busy you all are in the times of Zoom and remote working. We have less time than before. And uh, so Anne and Sydney, where are you right now? Hmm. Sydney, uh, where are you? I'm in, I'm in Highland Park, New Jersey. Yeah, and Anne? I'm locked down in New York City. <laughs> since March. We've been closed since March and we're not reopening at least till April 1st next year. We don't know. So Lincoln Center might open in April, theoretically, you think? No, uh, for, the, for the staff to get ready and then we oh. would, I mean, it all depends, we don't know. But we're hoping to be able to rehearse, to bring our, I mean, if you go to my office, to my theater, Everyone's shoes are still on the floor in the dressing room. Everyone's clothes are still hanging. It's sort of like Snow White. You know, a spell came over the theater and the performances stopped. And so we have to revive them as soon as we're able to by law. Uh, but we have to rehearse them a little first to make sure that everybody remembers <laughs> that they're blocking. But we're hoping, who knows, maybe in, maybe in the fall. Um, Frank, I wanted to, I was saying to Sine, I wanted to start because you're doing such a variety of, of um, hours on dramaturgy um, with a little bit about how Sydney and I know each other. And really, there's one credit you didn't mention that is, I think, the most important in terms of our relationship, which was that, which was Sydney's association with the Crossroads Theater, a theater that's no longer in existence, but was a hugely important theater for many, many years when we started. Um, and you very kindly avoided using the word old, but we have been doing this for a very long time. Um, and I, I, I mentioned to you before, but I thought it would be important to start this way. Um, I think it's important for people who are younger or people who are from other countries to realize, uh, and that's what we always do as dramaturgs, we sort of situate things and sort of see where we're coming from, that America does not have a, a long theater tradition. It does have a um, theater tradition in New York, starting with the American Revolution, English troops came over, just like during Shakespeare's time, they went to Germany and started theater in Germany. They're always traveling troops of players. You see them in Huckleberry Finn, et cetera. And, and then in the 19th century, there were stars that came, Sarah Bernhardt and Duza and Oscar Wilde. And they performed, of course, in New York at theaters that looked like English theaters. And then they went to Colorado and Seattle, but it was basically imported material. Um, and that's through the 19th century, really. There's an exception to that that I, I really feel like I should mention. Um, and it's quite interesting. Um, there were a lot of uh, almost what you would call native plays that, uh, that were um, about f folk heroes like Davy Crockett uh, and uh, the, the American Yankee character, etc. These were not art plays, they weren't really that good, but they're very interesting and they deal with a lot of contemporary current events. And Lynn Thompson, who was the later the dramaturg of Rent, started a, a, an organization called the America at Play, which I think is still online, America at Play, which brought these texts together with contemporary young writers who adapted them. So there was that, although you can't hold it up alongside Moliere or Shakespeare or something like that, but that's that's about there what all there was, and the first American playwright is of course O'Neill, and he's he wrote a hundred years ago. Um, so our tradition is very new, and it is not regional in scope. And Lincoln Center Theater, which is a big organization, 
um, dates from the late 1960s when the Ford Foundation for the Arts and Humanities started a very um, a big, brilliant program to build theaters around the country. So Lincoln Center was built, the Dallas Theater Center, Denver Theater Center, you know, the Taper, the La Jolla, you know, it spread theater around the country. Um, they had no idea what was going to be performed in those theaters. And at the time, I think there was a statistic that only 3% of Americans had ever been in a theater because we're not a nation of, we're a nation of immigrants. We're people, we, we're descended from people who don't have an asset, you know, an art going tradition, um, a, a certainly a theater going tradition. So it was kind of all new. So they built the theaters in the late sixties, um, they were done. And then everyone realized, oh, someone has to work there. Um, and so they began to hire artistic directors and managing directors, but the staffing was very small. And then by some miracle of chance that had nothing to do with any of us, but that was a larger sign of fortune, this just coincided by sheer fate with perhaps the largest outpouring of playwriting that, I, that I've ever heard of. Maybe you'd have to go back to the Elizabethans to find a similarly large group. Um, and it was a group of playwrights, maybe numbering 100, 200, none of whom had trained, none of whom had gone to school. And all of them were writing about what they knew, where they were from in very different styles. It wasn't a stylistic form of realism or some kind of you know other form of drama. It was extremely varied. So you had, if you talk about regional, you had the California school, and then we all know Sam Shepard, let's say, or David Henry Wong, who started out there, or Chicago, you had David Mamet or Steve Tessich, people like that. In the Midwest, you had, you know, Beth Henley and August Wilson and Lanford Wilson writing about their world. Um, a lot of writing which very experimental, Irene Fornes or, or uh, M. Tazaki, uh, Shange. Uh, Tina Howe started as a very experimental writer. So it was just an incredible upsurge of writers of, of um, again, non-trained. And so what happened is because the theaters were there and nobody knew what to do with them, all these people started sending their plays to these theaters. There were no agents. I think there was one agent, Audrey Wood, who represented Tennessee Williams, but she was too grand for all of us. And so I think Sydney and I began because, because theaters just needed somebody to read a pile of manuscripts. And, and I recall, and I'll turn it over to you, Sydney. I mean, I recall at the beginning of my career, which was in the in the late seventies, having to read like fifty scripts a week. I mean, just so many plays were coming in, and it was an exciting time because, of course, when when you're reading that volume, you know, not all of them are very good, but some of them are just incredible. And and so we would scout through them to find plays for our theaters, but most importantly, and that's the reason we date back for so many for so many decades is that we would occasionally find a play and say, I can't get my artistic director to do this, but let me send this to Bonnie Maranka at the American Place or Morgan Jeunesse at the Public or Sidney Mahone at Crossroads. Or, I mean, there were so many people working. And so we would just send each other things and say, you know, this seems like it's right for your theater. My own theater at that time, the Phoenix Theater, was a theater that was devoted to new plays by both American and European writers, mm -hmm. new playwriters. So that's why I did those translations. So I bought to Charles, I worked with Mustafa Matura, who was from the West Indies, did a world premiere of his. We did some American world premieres. So it was a combination. And Sydney was um, beginning to work at Crossroads, which had its own focus. So maybe I could turn this over to Sydney <laughs> to pick up the story. Thank you, that's, oh. that's important. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Frank, for hosting this and uh, having me be a part of it. Um, I'm struck, Annie, with the way the history comes forth. Um, sort of an alternate history is running parallel with what you described. And I think about 
the roots of what we now think of as black theater um, beginning during the period of slavery and um, the oldest known black theater in the 1820s in the village, in Greenwich Village, um, the African Grove Theater. So that was William Wells Brown's effort. And um, it seems to me that so much of black theater has a certain um, reference point during this period because that was the beginning of what we now refer to as minstrel theater. And it was very much an improvisational act, but also a, a, a force of social critique because it involved uh, the people who were enslaved imitating white people who were imitating black people in their rendering of what they understood as black culture. Um, and of course it was very much about ridicule and um, hmm, denigration. And so for the black people who were witnessing this and um, subject to it, it became a matter of them taking it into their own hands and reframing it so that it became um, a critique of, of white cruelty and white um, dismissal um, of the humanity of black people. So that's interesting. And, it, and I think we're still um, fighting to uh, not, there's no effort to deny that because musical theater is a part of it as well. Its roots are there, but um, this alternate positioning of black performers as somehow outside of the mainstream is something that uh, continues to challenge us. And now there's a discussion about how we incorporate black artists and there's a great deal of um, crossing the boundaries, if you will, that has occurred such that it may seem that black theater isn't even needed anymore because there are so many black artists in all forms of performance. So, um, but this notion of dealing with race, I think is, is perhaps the common denominator throughout the history of black performance in America. And, um, I think the, the great thing about it is that one of its tenets is that it always be new. There's no, uh, there's no way to progress if you are doing what someone else did. So yeah, everyone has to really find a unique form and a unique voice in order to break through this uh, great wall of black stereotypes. Um, so that, that, that was one thing that crossed my mind, but also um, when you speak about during the time that we met, yes, it was the mounds of scripts and the formation of literary departments in order to uh, process this. And it was, it was exciting. And there, there was a much smaller group of dramaturgs in, in the Northeast anyway, that really formed a family, it seemed to me. Um, the, thing that I was excited about is the opportunity to make different choices than places like uh, the Lincoln Center or, you know, McCarter Theater, any other regional theater of note, or even the smaller theaters um, in New York. And that gave us an opportunity to introduce some new voices. And that was always the most exciting thing or to um, present new work from established writers such as in Tazaki Shange. Um, the, the great thing about having a, a small network of dramaturgs at the time that I entered the field, I was in graduate school and really just um, running a playwriting competition that was uh, held at Crossroads and um, there was so many scripts and so it was 
out of that experience that we established the literary department. And um, the fact that the winner of that contest was George C. Wolfe's The Colored Museum was a thrilling moment for all of us because it was extraordinary in its um, innovation in terms of form, even as it um, hearkened back to the evolving tradition of black theater, it did have elements of um, the minstrel tradition and the vaudevillian experience. Um, but that, that let us know that there were many more new plays to come in that same way that the Colored Museum came forth. Um, so I was happy to begin that process. And the other thing that was important to me was um, really finding and supporting developing women writers. And that became one of my major efforts. Um, I think there were three, Crossroads started in 1978 and I think there had been three writers, three women writers by the time I'd come in the early eighties. And it was my goal to increase those numbers substantially and, and we did, so I was happy about that. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I wanted to just jump off of what you were saying at the beginning. You know, it's because uh, I've become very interested in this since I've been locked in my apartment for the last eight months. Um, it's very interesting today. Um, most people now, young people come out of colleges and that's their training. I mean, we did go to college, but there was no dramaturgy in college. We, right. we certainly didn't learn anything about it. Um, but I've been surprised when you talk about the African Grove Theater. Do do I, I'm I'm surprised how few people know the history of things. And if we talk about African American theater, that's that's one subject. But there are other subjects you can add as well. I mean, where was it? Park Place. Who worked in it? You know, do people know about the Astor Place riots? Uh, I have been. I should just say this now to all the hundreds or thousands of people listening to this. I have been trying to get somebody, and it's probably going to have to end up being me, to, write, to, to interview Arthur French, a mm. man who has a mind that is so sharp. Yeah. And Arthur French has, has gone through the entire history of Black theater. I mean, I mean back to Langston Hughes. I, I don't even know if he, I don't think he knew Zora, but you know, Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, the, and the whole history started in churches, you know, and Hadley players. And, you know, do people right. know those organizations? I just did an interview in American Theater last month with Steve Carter right before he passed. Oh, wonderful. And um, that's yeah. where everybody at the Negro Ensemble Company started. They, they met each other doing something in the basement of a church in Harlem. And, and I don't know that that's ever been documented. And, and Arthur... Who, who has worked, who started there, but then has worked with everyone. I mean, he's worked in every show. It's unbelievable, his career. I mean, if I could find somebody to just help me record, I actually emailed him and, you know, we talked and I said, would you do this? He said, yes, but I, I don't, some young bright person who is looking for a dissertation topic should just interview Arthur French and you would have the whole history of, of the theater, maybe it's going to have to end up being me. I hope it isn't because they're probably younger, smarter people who could do it. But it's funny that 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 history has you see it vanishing. You know. Yes, yes, and at the same time, um, you know, there there were uh, anthologies, the Black Theater USA, that captures some of this history. It's sort of like the beginning. Um, that was uh, James V. Hatch's collection and he made it two volumes. I think it is more uh, closely held and honored in African-American studies departments, but it's not a required part of, you know, the history uh, module that you have to go through to get a degree in theater. And so even in academe, the African-American uh, tradition is 
run on a parallel track. It's something outside of the mainstream that's not required. It's uh, an elective or uh, something that you actually have to fight to get into the curriculum. And once you do, it's a dynamic and powerful experience because there, and you can never properly cover even a quarter of it in the time that you have. Um, but I think that it's, um, it's beginning to, I guess we're recognizing that we need to recover and restore this. And um, I think that's a great invitation you sent out. <laughs> there are so many other people who have bits. Uh, Woody King is a tremendous font of knowledge and um, history. Uh, but it was in the 70s or 60s and 70s that the, the small black theaters came into uh, existence and a lot of the black playwrights were able to come through there uh, like Penumbra, August Wilson coming through Penumbra um, and Woody's New Federal. Uh, There's so many, I'm sorry, I'm not able to just name them at the moment. My mind is racing, <laughs> so full of um, issues that are raised with this topic. Um, but all I can say is that, yes, there's yet much to recover and to um, place into the, the canon in a respectable way. And I, I am definitely inspired by all that you're doing and to just even capture what dramaturgy has wrought in this country. Um, and it's a great um, clue to what so many of us can do in this time where we're not able to make new theater, but we can certainly take some space and, and record what we have done. Because even as the uh, 19th century um, and 20th century has yet to be um, fully unearthed, there, this period that we came through is also not documented in a comprehensive way. And I've often thought of it as something that um, is in my wheelhouse because of course I've thought often about just writing about crossroads and that in itself <laughs> has a, an incredible arc of evolution in, it, in the writers that were produced there. Um, just in my own experience, it started with George C. Wolfe and ended with August Wilson and Rita Dove and a whole lot of variation in between there. The, uh, the comedic writers, um, the uh, hip hop writers. So there's so much to uh, just capture, preserve and lift up. Yeah, and Sydney, I, I think, I think uh, not only just building on that, you know, I, I, I think what's interesting now, if, if we're talking together in 2020 about, you know, where we are and, and you know what people know and what people don't. What's interesting to me is how little um, people who are entering the field know about so many things in our past. So you talked just now very eloquently about your own experience, but but I know um, I mean I, I'm involved in this thing called the Sustaining Legacy Project, which is a new initiative that the Dramatist Skills Foundation is overseeing, which um, there are so many recognized, award-winning, popular with audiences, playwrights uh, still alive who have just vanished into obscurity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe they were ahead of their time. Uh, I mean, they were popular, but young people don't seem to know their work. So we're giving out awards. National New Play Network is joining us. They're going to be touring, you know, offering their the, these writers productions. I can't tell you who the first winners are because we haven't announced them yet. Right. Lala keeps getting put off, but 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 you'll you'll know who they are. They're very interesting, so people should look for that. But Marsha Norman has started an initiative, um, which was kind of shocking to me, of all the women playwrights that we work with who've also been forgotten. And this yep. isn't just a 20th century phenomenon. is isn't just since the 1970s. I mean, if you go back into so I'm very into 
the classics and Shakespeare and stuff. If you go back to, you know, writers like Margaret Cavendish, who wrote in, I don't even, can't even remember when, 1680 or something, mm. nobody knows who she is. Uh, so so there, are, there are a lot of um, amazing writers who have been forgotten, who haven't been brought to life or et cetera. And that to me seems, as I gradually leave the field, yeah. something that that people, uh, you know, you don't have to constantly reinvent the wheel. You, of course, you will reinvent the wheel because you have your own sensibility. But there are things to be mined. There are things that can be adapted. There are things that can be brought back, um, because ultimately, what you what you have to have, which we know from our own experience, is you have to have a joyful group of collaborators who love each other and are free and really like the work. And then you have to have an audience. Yes. If you just have six people who are your friends who like the same thing, it's not going to go anywhere. Yes. You've got to find work. So you start with somebody you like, like George Wolfe, and then an awful lot of people like that work. Mm -hmm. And there begins a whole story. Um, and, and so that seems to me harder to do when you cut off the tradition from the past because you just don't know it. Right, right. The tradition is so important. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking of Morgan Jeunesse. You and Morgan were like my big sisters when I came in because you all had already established your departments and the processes to make it work, um, sort of the protocols, if you will. And um, from the response letters to playwrights or uh, the we, calls. We answered them all. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I tried. I, you know, it got ahead of me, but. Um, and we should, we should add Morgan Jeunesse was the dramaturg at the public theater. She worked for Joseph Papp, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, she was on Siegel Talks, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that uh, network just continued to expand, but the, the point I guess I want to make is that there's the process of making the work that we are now challenged to reinvent at this moment in history. How do you make work that whose future is unknown at this time? And then there's the process of preserving what has been done. Both things are important, but they seem to be two different uh, initiatives, if you will. And I'm, I'm concerned about both, but it, as you say, Annie, um, as we kind of see the exits for our, our careers, it's very important that we preserve what, what happened on our watch, if you will. What was your journey from both of you? How did you get to become a dramaturg? Anne, do you want to start? <laughs> Not particularly. <but> <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, I've just written this book, um, and I obviously have to have to deal with it. And I actually don't really know. I mean, I had, I, I had lived when I was young, like a sixteen-year-old. I lived in Germany. Um, I had no. I mean, I, I, I went to the theater, but I had no interest in theater. I've never been interested in acting or whatever. I went to concerts. I did all kinds of other things, but I had no particular interest. So maybe I knew something about it from then, I don't know. Um, I, I, I knew I didn't want to act. As I always say, there are two kinds of people in the theater, the people who will do anything to get on a stage and the people who will do anything to get off a stage. I was definitely in the latter category. Um, and so I didn't really know what to do. Uh, and, you know, I, I wrote, criticism and then I, I did a little directing. I was a very good seamstress. I did a lot of work in costume shops. That's always very useful. Uh, you learn everything about a theater when you just keep your head down in the costume shop. You know everything that's going on. Um, but, uh, you know, and then I did a little directing, but, you know, finding myself at midnight, taking a phone call from an actor and hearing myself saying, but you're wonderful at the show. I thought, you know what? I think I'll let somebody else do this. <laughs> so I think it really just came down to, I taught for a while. Um, I got a job, you know, like you did. You know, you find yourself in a job and then there were all these scripts to be read. And then I started realizing, 
oh, I like doing this. I like finding people. And I've always liked recommending people. And, you know, as you remember calling up and saying, you have to read this play or just yeah. telling a playwright, you have to send your script. In fact, when I was, we started this organization that's now very established, Lambda, Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas. I ended up calling it of the Americas because there were Canadian dramaturgs, Mexican dramaturgs. This has made it complicated. But um, we used to send out this script exchange. Do you remember this? Yes. We mailed it, you know. In other words, you know, I would find plays that I loved. Some of them I could get on at my theater. This was back at the Phoenix, way before it was at Lincoln Center. Um, and others, I just could not talk them into doing for one reason or another. We all were in the same boat. So we would type up, you know, every, I think it went out like five times a year, mm -hmm. uh, five or six dramaturgs would type up, here are three or four plays that I cannot get my artistic director to do, but I think they're really great. And here's why I love them. And then we would put the home address and phone number of the of the playwright, <laughs> and and say three women, two men, you know, two sets, because you know there were a lot of small theaters that that was important. That's another thing we should mention for anyone listening who's not American is we have no theater subsidy in America. There's no national subsidy, so we have to hustle in a different way. It's it's a good thing. Now, because when all the money has disappeared, we're totally at home. We're not used to having money. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at theaters in Europe who have these lavish subsidies, we've always been in a different situation. We have to earn our money at the, at the box office or through donations by our tax system allows you to lower your tax rate if you donate. But we have no government subsidy. I was once at a, I became friends with the literary manager at the Comédie Française, a very grand theater, lovely guy, Jean, Jean Louvier. We did a press conference together and they were asking us about funding and he said, oh, the Comédie Française, which had a budget sort of like Lincoln Center's, gets 99% of its operating budget every year on January 1st. What about Lincoln Center? And I said, Lincoln Center Theater, which is one of the largest not-for-profit theaters in America, gets less than 1% of its budget from city, state, and federal sources combined. I think it's less than one half of 1%. Mm. So it's such a completely different situation where you where you are kind of going back to the roots of theater, where you, where you have to kind of, you know, devise strategies to find plays that you love and your actors love and your audiences will love. It's a different situation than a very structured theater, which is what other, other countries are used to. And we're jealous of that now when we see you know, bills in London for bailing out London theaters for 2 billion euro. I mean, can you imagine? Woo. Well, this is um, a really powerful point to bring to light because I think it, it definitely points to the problem that we're having right now. The, uh, the model for the financial model is not working, is no longer, uh, Applicable, applicable in a moment like this. And it's, um, yes, people are making all kinds of efforts to find alternative ways to make theater in this moment, but without a way to, uh, I don't know, meet capitalism, it's really shattered the way we can even think about how to go forward. And I think it's um, it's really a time for transformation because the multi-million dollar blockbuster Broadway musical is not going to just come back, you know, after a week of restoration rehearsal. Um, how, I mean, it's not just the health issue that prevents us from all gathering in a space, it's also the financial model. And um, I can only hope that this forces us to re-examine how that, how that functions because that's also a large part of why certain people are excluded yeah. from it. Yeah. Um, when Crossroads, for example, hit financial problems, there were no major donors because it's the private sector that basically supports uh, commercial theater and and really regional theater as well. Um, there was no 
you know, large donor to bail them out. And so things took a turn for the worst there for a moment. They have recovered and are back in action. But I mean, it was a big deal that Penumbra got $1 million of whatever the new grant source was just recently mm -hmm. um, in response to the, the social reckoning that we have, um, the racial reckoning for social justice. I mean, that should not be extraordinary given the whole economy of professional theater in this country. But we're happy that it happened and hopefully it will create a new um, way forward. But, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I totally agree with you. And I think in some regards, you know, I, I'm using the time that I'm sitting in my apartment to really rethink a lot of things mm -hmm. um, because I think it's a good, somebody said, this is what change feels like. It's this difficult. It's this yeah. know, traumatic. I mean, certainly it's traumatic, but you're absolutely right about that. I mean, I, I had cited that statistic that when, when the regional theaters were built, 3% of Americans had ever been in a theater. But actually, you know, a, a while ago, let's say 2015 or something, more Americans had gone to theater than were going to theater every year than were going to professional football games. I mean, wow. people like the theater. And we have seen regional theaters really grow in many different communities. Um, and, and, when you have a city, small, a smaller city, not New York, let's say, you know, you, you, you want a forward thinking industry, you want a university, you want some, some uh, you want some culture, you want restaurants, you want a good theater, you know, people, people like it. Um, and I think for all of us, my, my own, well, I won't be part of this, but you know, what we witnessed is when we met each other, the theaters really had a distinct identity. They had very specific groups of writers. They were serving, I mean, many audience members went to many theaters. They were just mm -hmm. into it. But that's gotten to be much more uniform now. And I think it's because my own feeling is that because a lot of theaters, you know, the building was big and more people got hired and boards of directors know what a marketing director is and they know what a press agent, what is a dramaturg, you know, or, I, mean, I mean, there used to be playwrights on salary at theaters, you know, Lanford Wilson was on salary at Circle Rep, you know, there were many theaters that included in the artistic departments, writers and residents, and then gradually they got, well, why are we doing this, you know, that last play wasn't as good as we had hoped, they got moved out, and you began to notice in, um, Publications like American Theater, which used to print the repertory of every theater around the country. You could see what was going on at, in Santa Fe or in Denver. It, it used to be very varied. And then over a period of like, let's say in the 90s into the, into the, into 2000. So the same plays would show up over and over and over. They were the plays that had won the Tony. I mean, they were still new, new plays or plays or had won the Pulitzer. And the same plays would be done like 50 times right. as opposed to 50 plays being done, you know, and, and it became more conservative and Broadway too, you know, you know, you have just endless, you know, it's like, a, it's like Disneyland, jukebox musicals and yes. you know, Disney stuff and the kind of plays that you could see there, that, and there were quite a few varied ones, even on Broadway, have a, such a hard time now. Yes. Um, I mean, you couldn't... Well, you couldn't get a theater for Serafina now, you know. Oh, we did. Yeah. oh my God! So, you know, that's something that that needs to change. And also, I, as I always say to my directors, and this is something I'll end with for now, and then let Frank ask us a question. You know, it, it, it's important, I think, for young people. I always say to my directors, think about your aunt and your uncle. Mm -hmm. You you know what play you want to go see. Right. But think about other people besides yourself. What would they see? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, could you talk them into going to see the play that you're working on or that your friends are working on so that the theater is not a rarefied elitist space that only people who have gone to graduate school and theater want to attend. It, it lives in the community. You should have your, your, the mayor of your town uh, come to the opening nights of your shows. You should, you part like Crossroads was a part of New Brunswick. It was important, you know, yeah. and and fitting into a community, uh, 
did your roommates, if you went to college, did your roommates from college who went into whatever law or something, are they supporting you? You know, so that just doesn't become like a little niche thing that isn't really about what's going on in the community. That seems to be something that's changed. Well, I think your model for uh, practicing dramaturgy is just extraordinary because in the past few moments, you've mentioned the director's lab. Now, directing is not dramaturgy, um, you know, in a in a formal sense. And yet, the fact that you had the vision to uh, assemble directors and match them with writers is dramaturgy at the next level. <laughs> not working on a script; it's creating the infrastructure, the architecture for new work to happen. And I think that is still a challenge that we face even more dramatically in this moment. Yeah, um, that's true. I mean, that's one thing that, that a lot of us have been interested in. I mean, that's a good thing about being a dramaturg in America. No one knows what the hell it is. So you, <laughs> could, you could do whatever you want. Right. But uh, Frank and I have talked often about international work and, and the I, I realized because I was writing some copy for the website uh, at Lincoln Center's website. If you go to the director's lab, it should be up. Um, this program has been going for 25 years. Amazing, because I'm only 40. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is, it is the largest, most diverse, most international, most diverse in every possible way. I've accepted more women than men in the program since 1995. And, and I... I gather them and then I leave the room uh, and they're there day and night. They, they work 10 hours a day for three weeks. And so when you have somebody from, from, you know, Panama talking to somebody from Atlanta, talking to somebody from, you know, Kenya, talking from, to somebody from Uzbekistan and they're saying, or somebody from Rome and they're saying, well, the, this kind of theater is really important. And the other ones say, well, what is that kind of theater? You know, that's yeah. when you really begin to get, you know, and I'm not privy to those conversations. I'm yeah. home cooking dinner, <laughs> <laughs> stage managers are running them. But, but then they, you know, they work from 10 to 10 and at 10 they go out to a bar and they keep talking. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because people mm. really want that exchange of ideas and different traditions and different, you know, and I'm very interested in people from different parts of the U.S. I mean, there's so much, you know, theaters that are starting in Alaska or in Santa Fe, New Mexico or Hawaii. I love people who direct in churches. Mm -hmm. I love people, you know, in drama ministries. I love people who direct on cruise ships, you know. I mean, <laughs> what are those experiences like? Right. And so it's fun to put everything together, you know. Mm. That's been a joy. Well, we, when you mentioned the international dimension, I think that was also important to... Uh, Rick Kahn, Lee Richardson, the founders of Crossroads Theatre Company, uh, because there is such a thing known as the African diaspora. And so when you mentioned, um, and, and Rick is from Trinidad, so there was a connection there naturally, but also the opportunity to, um, so when you mentioned Mustafa Matura, I'm pretty sure that that was how he also came to us at Crossroads. Yeah, actually. <laughs> and then um, Serafina was something that just completely thrilled the theater community, the arts community, and was so dynamic. Um, this combination of ensemble and improvisation and precise choreography and precise text. I mean, it was, it was phenomenal, and so then that in a sense led to our opportunity to work on Sheila's Day, mm -hmm. which was focused on women, um, domestic workers in both the US and uh, South Africa, in Johannesburg. And we had a cast of African-American and South African actors who worked with Mungani and Gama and Duma and Lova to create a piece um, that was taking advantage of both traditional um, forms of theater and also bringing it up to the contemporary moment. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting, um, you know, uh, in, my, in my little bio, I mentioned that it's, I have been with John Guare, the executive editor of the Lincoln Center Theater Review, issue number 77 for years. It's a literary review. 
Uh, okay, how did that start? Before my time at Lincoln Center, um, as Serafina was beginning to gather its forces and get organized, I came when it was running already, um, the theater tried to get some press on Serafina. And it was before Nelson Mandela was released. And no one would cover the show. Yeah. No yeah. one would cover the show. And that should never be a problem for a dramaturg. <laughs> and it certainly yeah. wasn't a problem for John Guerra. He said, screw it, let's start our own magazine. So yeah. we started the Lincoln Center Theater Review. He started it and did an interview with Duma and did an interview with Bongani and did a whole thing, you know, conversation with South African playwrights. Um, and then when Mandela was released, suddenly everybody was like, wow, you know, and then we just had this amazing, amazing run. This is before we moved the show down to Broadway to the court, where you realize the theater was changing history. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, Bishop Tutu came. I mean, it was just yeah. absolutely incredible. And then all, all the kids in the show, and it finally closed, there was a movie made and toured Europe. They all went into the Lion King. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that was just starting at that time and the assistant directors were in the director's lab and they were looking for actors and they actually have a casting office in Suejo. And my, just to end this story, my, my favorite thing is I was in South Africa because I did, I put together two South African theater festivals after that of younger writers that we did at the Lincoln Center Festival, very good work. Um, and so I, I went to, to uh, South Africa with, with uh, John Rockwell who was running the festival and to be in Soweto on a Sunday morning with Duma, and you and I know Duma, in this purple BMW or whatever the hell he was driving. You know, it was very quiet. We were, we were driving, you know, turned a corner in, in Soweto, and there were guys, you know, standing outside of Shabin drinking, and this purple car pulls up, and the whole corner goes, Lincoln Center Theater. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's phenomenal. That reminds me of a story that Ruby and Asi told in their memoir about uh, Asi's play, Pearly Victorious, going to Broadway, and both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King attended the performance. And <laughs> it was a, you know, a satire that was a little bit, that made people uncomfortable, but the fact that they both came and, um, encouraged or just celebrated the fact that artists have a different role in the struggle for uh, for justice and freedom and humanity and that there is a way to uh, prick the conscience of your community by even making them uncomfortable or pushing buttons that um, force them to oh stand against stand against their own um, resistance, I guess, because eventually you give in. If it's good art, you're going to give in. Um, but the, the issue, I also wanted to say this about Sheila's Day, which came after Serafina. So Mongani and Dumar were big stars then. But by the time they got to theater, to Crossroads, it was an ensemble of women. And there was an effort that was successful for the women to also be acknowledged as co-creators of this work. So that would include Ebony Joanne, Dooley, Tuli Dumakuri. Joanne, my God, I have I love her. Yes, you and know, she, and Sheila, Sheila's day is about cleaners. She, domestic Sheila. workers, yeah. yeah. They were called Sheila in South Africa. Um, but it was interesting. Um, they both had Thursdays off, both in South Africa and in the US. Um, there's so many, and, and some of the music was common because the Christ, Christian tradition was also part of it. But I just wanted to um, throw one tidbit about how I became a dramaturg. I think it begins with me as a young person in my church. And by the, by the time I got to college, I understood that the theater I was interested in had more to do with the church than the circus this notion of ritual, this notion of healing through movement, music, um, and ideas um, could alter your, your way of being. Um, and that became a kind of fundamental concept for the kind of theater that I tried to uh, 
uh, advance. Frank, that's it. You can't top that. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It's really, really, really true. And uh, I think Roncier, the philosopher, said, you know, we have to create civil ceremonies that do not reproduce the ones of the religion, of the monarchs, you know, of the dictators, of the marches, you know, of military. Mm. These are uh, civil ceremonies in theater that reflect the complexity of the world we live in, includes communities, looks back as you guys did, reinforces new voices and creates, uh, it is part of the change. But uh, my question, pioneers, of dramaturgy in America. It didn't exist. You couldn't study it. Even now it's hard to show. Maybe you don't even need to study it. It's also a good, a good thing. But what is your definition of you would say, this is what dramaturgy is about. What is it about for you? Why is it so important in the theater? I, I'm going to uh, let Sydney start to answer that. Oh, we only have two minutes left, but I'm going to go get my manuscript and read you. We have a bit more time. It doesn't have to be just an hour. Okay. So don't worry. Um, don't worry. So, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go read you the, the great dramaturg of the Guthrie Theater, Michael Lupu, made a definition that's so brilliant. I put it in my book. Okay, so you'll get it. <laughs> well, for me, dramaturgy is the process of developing and fulfilling the playwright's vision. Um, it involves facilitating collaboration because quite often the playwright loses status as the other collaborators come into the process. The director has the uh, control of the actors and of the clock. And there may be moments where oh, we need to make this decision, make this change just to make it work in the moment, but it may not be in keeping with the playwright's vision. So fulfilling the playwright's vision sometimes involves this collaborative facilitation and other times it involves pushing the playwright to remain true to the vision that inspired the play or to remain true to the process that lets them know how to evolve through the play, how to change the play. Um, there's so there are other dimensions too, but when I when I think of dramaturgy, I see myself in the rehearsal room, um, observing the process that brings this project from an idea to a fully realized performance, um, and the challenge of communicating with an audience in the way that the writer intends to is, is part of my uh, concern, that it be conveyed in the way that they intended. And sometimes it can be um, misconstrued or confused or the writer thinks they're doing something that's not actually on the page. Those kinds of questions are always fascinating because they bring out something that even I, asking the question, had no way to imagine how it would be answered. And those answers are often the dynamic discoveries that we all want to make as artists and as audience. Hmm. Annie's back, let's hear it. Back. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is Michael Lupu, recently passed, who was at the Dr Guthrie Theater for many years. And he said, to limit the definition of dramaturgy to research and gathering of relevant background information is to leave out its true vitality and creativity. Dramaturgy functions as a sort of monitoring device meant to keep the process on course, whether a barely audible yet persistent whisper or a vocally assertive and persuasive argument dramaturgy does not emanate exclusively from one individual who qualifies as dramaturg. Rather, it forms the underpinning of all intuitive or deliberate choices, thoughts, debates, and nurtures the passionate search for artistic truth on stage. Well said, very well said, yeah. <laughs> He's pretty smart. <laughs> mm -hmm. For the artistic search for truth on stage. And, and what, do you, what, what goes through your mind? I mean, that was his, but what do you think? 
I couldn't say it better than that. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and I think, you know, the, 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 the wonderful part of it is, is all the relationships you form on the way. I mean, one of the, one of the few places on earth, we're certainly living through this right now, where people have to learn to get along um, is the theater, maybe sports too, you know, <laughs> but, but, the, but the theater deals with very dark subjects. It's not a, happy play. The Greek plays aren't, you know, I mean, there's some comedies, but you know, they're about very Shakespeare, whatever. So it's not like we're avoiding difficult subjects. We're plunging into the most difficult subjects. The plays we've talked about just now in the last hour are examples of that. But some, somehow we as a tribe of theater people know how to deal with our egos to contribute collectively to that. And that, for if, if you're able to do that, it's a joy. And um, to have lived a life in those circles has been a joy. Mm. Well, can I just add one last thing? This conversation that we're having mm -hmm. is such an, uh, a wonderful gift for, for me today. And I think it's at the core, the very thing that all of us have to challenge ourselves to engage in. You speak about it in the context of making the play. But how else are we going to understand this moment that we're in right now if we don't continue to have conversations that are meaningful and difficult and even with questions that are unanswerable? But we have to have the courage to come to the screen, the table, the phone, uh, the six feet apart uh, gathering that will allow us to have a conversation. It's got to begin there. It sounds so simple and somewhat, I don't know, just too basic to be real, but there's no other way to understand the self or the relationship that we now have to this uh, drastically changing world. Thank you, Frank. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Yes, no, wait, wait, first, uh, not, so, not so super fast. Um, can it be taught? I mean, uh, Sydney, you are, I know you're the great Iowa Writers Workshop. And I know also at the university now they have a drama opportunity. But you didn't go to it. So how, what is the idea? Can that be taught? How should a dramaturgy, you think, feel, look like? How should it be? How should it be communicated? How should it be the knowledge transfer to a next generation or a new generation? Well, it absolutely can be taught, but um, that is the foundational knowledge base can be taught. But the uh, practice of it requires that you be in the room and gather and gain the experience um, of trying to bring a play into existence with integrity and with ethical uh, ethical. Uh, I don't know what the word is, but um, the, the history is important. The documentation is important. The research for the particular project is important. And these are skills that can be taught. Maybe it's writing playbill notes or interviewing the writer, those things that can be taught. The part that cannot be taught goes directly to what Anne was discussing about the relationships. That is something that has to be lived, built. You have to be in the room. Um, and it's something that if you are interested in theater, if you're interested in literature, as, as I have always been, um, the thing that you love will, will continue to lead you because you know what it is that made you fall in love with the play and you are there to, in a sense, protect that and elevate that, um, frame it in a way that allows it to uh, deliver its full message. So I think it can be taught and it should be taught. And at the same time, um, it continues to be redefined because for people who are serving as dramaturgs, say in dance or in curating, um, art exhibits, it, it may play a slightly different function, but basically I feel like you're led by the thing you love. And that's art, vision, and wisdom, insight, transformation. 
And, and I, I, I would just add to that, that, that um, and certainly in my experience, and I'm sure Sydney the same with you, is that um, the, the really best experiences are when you are working with all kinds of people. If you, if you only work with people who totally agree with you or you totally agree with them, then it's dull. It's when you are working with, you know, I mean, how difficult are the brilliant writers we've worked with <laughs> <laughs> no, you know. but right. but you gather in a room people with very powerful instincts and strong opinions and different takes etc and and theater people know how to find common ground and that's what makes it interesting if everybody comes in having the same opinion no one is going to want to see it it's it's about it's about sorting it out like we would think about a country sorting something out which is definitely right. not what we're seeing right now going on around us i mean i, I would i've come to the feeling you know, and put this in my book but it, i i've come to the feeling that um i did a production at lincoln center when i first came um of measure for measure um which is such an interesting play and so relevant today. Well, they're all relevant today. Um, and it was the most interesting cast. Um, and it was a pretty straight production, straight up production, Mark Lamos directed it. Uh, and it included, um, you know, Lorraine Toussaint, it included uh, Jack Weston, the great comic actor from, from Broadway and, and Hollywood. It included Reggie Montgomery. It included Campbell oh. Scott, Brad Whitford. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it was Thomas Ikeda, Ethel Eichelberger, who was a, a sort of denizen of the downtown theater, gay theater. It was a really diverse cast. And it was uh, taking place, um, Len Carew. Who, who was the first person, to, you know, he was Sweeney Todd. He was the first person to sing all those Sondheim songs. I mean, it was such, it was not only diverse and ethnically, it was diverse in terms of, you know, the downtown theater and the Broadway theater and, you know, whatever. Um, and we and, and we all loved each other. And it was set sort of in a period in New York like now. It was during the kind of decline of New York when things were really rough. Remember the headline? Mm -hmm. Ford to New York drop dead, you know, it was kind of <laughs> right, right. during bonfire of the vanities by Thomas Wolfe, you know, and, and that was kind of what that play was about to some degree. So we didn't really have to do much with it. We just had to, you know, a lot of hypocrites in that play, a lot of dissembling, it, it, it mirrored right. what was going on outside the theater. So we did it very simply and it was very interesting, very relevant. Um, but, but so, and we used to all have dinner. We would, I would cook dinner for everybody or somebody else would cook. And, you know, we, we, we were a company, although a really disparate company. Um, and it was interesting uh, when, we, when we, we would talk that everybody in the cast who was over the age of 50, like Leonard or Jack Weston, uh, had not gone to college. Hmm. They had trained as actors uh, so Len was at Stratford, Ontario. He was a spear carrier and had come up the ranks, just like you do in Shakespeare's time. And and Len had been at the, I mean, uh, Jack Weston had been at the Cleveland Playhouse. And when you hit the the actors, for, and and Reggie was the first black clown in Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey wow. Circus, you know. Wow. But but when you hit the you know age forty and under, everyone had gone to college. Mm. Mm. And to some some degree, I think. You know, we may be at a point, I don't know, I have no way of knowing this. I mean, it's so expensive to go to college now. Mm -hmm. And and if you come into the theater thinking that you're gonna make money, you're a fool because you have to come into the theater because you can't do anything else and you love it and that's what your destiny is. If you come in with $200,000 worth of debt, you're just carrying a load. Yeah. And at the same time, the regional theaters are, are struggling and and, in the, when the theaters were, were founded, a lot of the labor, the spear carrying, the, you know, the, the giving lines to actors, the, the piece work that I did at this mm. costume shop, you know, was done by people who were interested in becoming part of the theater. So it was kind of a trade-off of experience for labor to some degree, just as you would have in Shakespeare's time when you had a 
and you know the apprentices in the company who would start out and gradually play the small roles and but they would take care of things so i i wonder you know if that may not happen and that uh, that training goes back into conservatories goes back you go to louisville like you used to in the old days and mm -hmm. learn about theater there which would help the theaters because i just don't i think it's it's too expensive sometimes now right to, oh. the whole model well, is I don't know. Expensive. Exactly. the whole the training and the producing of theater is all too the expensive whole, yeah. Yeah, but you, i just want to mm -hmm. add one quick thing about dramaturgy in some ways our conversation has, <clears throat> it, it highlights the finest moments of dramaturgy, and yet there is this other dynamic that has to do with conflict, dealing with conflict within the rehearsal room or between the playwright and the director, um, or between the dramaturg and the other collaborators, and figuring out how to let somebody else um, take the lead on something or realizing that you may not always be right um, or you may not have the answer. I see my role primarily as having the right question rather than the right answer. But there's that um, artistic conflict that also calls for a dramaturg to mediate. I, I think um, uh, there's a bit of diplomacy involved in it and we have to cross all the borders of um, of uh, each each medium that comes to work in the theater. We have to know all the languages and be able to um, foreground the thing that is important. But this, um, the training, it, how, I'm baffled by this moment. If somebody is like trying to just start college to be a set designer or something, the whole uh, environment has been, um, dismantled in a way that makes makes us have to start from the ground up. And that perhaps will be the blessing of it. We have to rethink. Yeah, amazing that the re also the dramaturg is not just the references, but also the referee. Is the last yeah. question, then are we going to go, um, what inspires you at the moment? What do you look at? What gives you hope? What do you read? What do you listen to? What inspiring thoughts do you have? And what maybe a piece of advice to someone who's listening who wants to be a director, a playwright, a dramaturg, a piece of advice. So what's inspiring you and what, what would you say to a young person? Um, well, I'll, I'll finish. I mean, I just wanted to say thank you to Sydney because that, that piece of advice that you just said was so brilliant. I mean, thank you. Anna. If you, if you have the answer, I mean, sometimes you do have the answer, but, but it's rare that you have the answer. But if you ask the question, somebody will have the answer. Right. And, 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 and that, that has happened to me hundreds of times in my career. And I, I, you, you feel something isn't quite, uh, but it turns, and it'll turn out to be the strangest person. You know, I mean, it'll be, right. it'll be a supporting actor who said to the main actor, what about if you try it this way? Play it as yeah. a joke. And then suddenly, Aha, uh -huh. and even the playwright didn't know that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's very smart. It's certainly not having the answer. It's mm -hmm. just knowing what question to, to ask. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, what Sine said earlier is um, there's so much change happening right now. And, and, and I think um, the, the, the desperate urge we all feel to be back together um, to be in a room, to be connecting to nothing more, nothing more wonderful than to watch an actor at work than to read a great play. You know, I, I don't think that's ever going to go away. It's never gone away. Um, and, and it will come back. Um, and, and I think we, we, we will see a different kind of theater, whatever that is. And that will be the result of the disruptions that we will have gone through. Yeah. And I think that's good. I think change is always good. Um, and we'll have to, I mean, it's really ultimately in here up to the writers, you know, they got to write, they're home writing, Just yeah. keep them writing, you know, because <laughs> they, they will, they have the eyes to see, and then we've got to be out there reading so we can say, here it is, you know, <laughs> let's, let's send this to this director, or let's send this to this theater, or let's do this, because uh, it's important. So I think change is good. And yeah. uh, 
be interesting to see what comes forward. Well, I think uh, you're right because the right play is going to energize, like ele just bring a certain group of people to a new level of action if it's the right play. The thing that has uh, inspired me is, as well as just being always open to the, the new writing is the fact that Kenosha, Wisconsin is my hometown and the event that happened there a few months ago regarding the shooting of an unarmed black man has kind of taken a certain focus um, that none of the previous events have taken for me. And one of the things that happened in the aftermath is that my brother, Tim Mahone, uh, who runs a foundation there and is very much connected to the corporate and business and uh, political community, much in the way that my mother was. He runs the foundation named for my parents, Mary Lou and Arthur F. Mahone. He ran the town hall with President-elect Biden and my sister, Artist Mahone, who works in the school system uh, as a parent liaison, uh, parent-teacher liaison, she got the kids to paint murals over the boarded up walls, boarded up windows that were um, necessary to try to protect the businesses. So I say this because this moment of racial reckoning is something that inspires me in the sense that I know the artists have a particular role to play. I would often, um, because my mother was a social worker, activist, um, I would always feel guilty about being in the arts because she was trying to get people food and keep their lights on and clothing and essentials to survive. And in the course of this, I have come to realize that yeah, artists are essential workers too. We're not gonna make it without this other dynamic that allows us to imagine and to yearn and to root for and to get up and exercise our own uh, will to, to survive. And that to me is where the art and where theater comes in. It's a real stretch, but that's what people, that's what I'm hoping the writers are doing. And that's the writing I wanna do. As I said, I'm amazing and significant. And all what you said is truly, is so profound even as you might say, you know, it sounds simple, but it's the significance. Ask questions, don't have the answers. Think about your uncle and aunt. Don't have everybody who has the same opinion you in the room, uh, but be a referee, try to get people together, reinforce voices, you select, you find something, help them. And also connect to communities who need a voice, who need a place, diverse ones, what, the, what, what they did. And, um, and yeah, to paint you know, paint on the yeah. boarded up walls in our minds and our lives. And uh, so this is so significant to so many others, what you said, and uh, a great uh, uh, a call also to take dramaturgy serious. It's important. I think it was Ed once who said, you want to go on a mountain, uh, you want to have the best team with you. You know, you want to know where you're going and to find out when react to the scene, the weather, this thing, everything changing roads uh, after landslides or whatever. So um, it is something essential. Of course, we do think and we encourage everybody also to take this as a, a, a as a reminder. You know, or question why wouldn't you have a dramaturg? You know, so or dramaturgical <laughs> thinking for your life, for your city, for your family, for the art piece you're working on, whether it's Sydney said in the gallery, whether it's in a film, whether it's for theater. So this is all a very, very significant. Really, really thank you for, we went a bit over time, but I thought that was important. Also hearing both of you, seeing the friendship and love you have for each other, also, but also for your work, for the theater, but also for life itself. This is a significant. And tomorrow we have uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Peter Akersall, who writes on contemporary uh, performance and that idea of the post-traumatic uh, dance and uh, the installation and the art comes in also like this idea of a uh, again and a kind of a new thinking about uh, that what still perhaps is not even there and it's always about that that's not there yet whether it's the law or whether it's democracy whether it's justice yeah. it's all about we are getting there and i think this is a big contribution really both thank you thanks for howl round again for hosting us 
and uh, VJ and Sia, Andy from the Seagulls, and then of course for you uh, who are listening. But I think if you listen closely what both of them said, there's something significant in there, also for our lives, for our work, wherever you are. And and take uh, let's take that really serious. So bye bye, and uh, really, really, really thank you, and also for taking this conversation so serious. Um, and I think that's what we need in this complicated time where we really don't know where we are going. So this was an important conversation.